The next one, me? Okay. Yeah, yeah smart yeah. contracts. Let's just talk about smart contracts a little bit. Um, so I, I have notes because I like to work from notes. But um, a smart contract, um, Okay. Yes, okay. So um, a smart contract is not a legal contract. It's a computer program. And it has um, some um, legal attributes. I think the term was uh, coined by Nick Zabo, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so to have a legally valid contract here in Canada and in many jurisdictions, it requires certain elements. So offer, acceptance, uh, consideration, meeting of the minds, these, ha these are legal terms of art and they have a specific um, meaning. Um, smart contracts can have these elements and they often do, uh, sometimes, but not all of them, not all of the time. Um, so, so you can see why uh, the term um, has sort of stuck. Um, so some uh, technical characteristics of smart contracts uh, first off, they live on the blockchain, specifically the Ethereum blockchain. There are other incarnations, like I think R3 has their own, and it has a different name, but um, I'm just going to uh, talk about the smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain for now. Um, so they are, Im they are immutable, so once they are deployed, they cannot be uh, changed or corrected. Um, they're always on, so as long as there are nodes active on the network, you can interact with that uh, smart contract, and uh, they run on gas. So uh, gas is sort of a, a technical aside, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, it costs money to run certain computations on the blockchain, and when uh, developers are writing smart contracts, they have to factor in a certain amount of ether uh, um, that in order to deploy that smart contract. Um, and that amount is called gas, and it's a totally arbitrary term, but uh, if, you, if you, uh, your contract runs out of gas, then it sort of stops. Um, and uh, the price of gas fluctuates similar to transaction fees. So there's a separate market gas, gas, mark, or gas price uh, calculation or something. Um, so now I'd like to talk about um, oracles in the context of uh, blockchain and smart contracts. So what it is, is an, it's an agent that uh, goes out into the real world and, um, and verifies occurrences and then submits that information to the blockchain so that it can be used by uh, a smart contract. So smart contracts are computer programs, they're deterministic, they, ca they cannot interact with the outside world. Um, oracles act as data feeds uh, to provide external data that can trigger uh, smart contract executions when certain predefined conditions are, are met. So those conditions could be something like the temperature of the weather outside, or whether a payment has been successfully processed, or certain price fluctuations. Um, so um, this is an IoT example that we, we thought would be uh, useful. So here, the fob swiping the, the keypad um, can, is a, it's an external data input. The keypad acts as the oracle, which sends that information to a smart contract. And, um, and, and, and when that happens, the smart contract uh, is trigger, triggers an event. In this case, all of the light bulbs in the house have their own address, so they all turn on. So that's how, how that would work. And um, the keypad is the oracle. So it could be a, 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 a machine, it could be a person, could be any sort of, the, the purpose is to provide external data in a secure and trusted manner. Um, now I'm just gonna go through some uh, use cases. So some of them are um, are just prototypes, and others are up and running, and you can interact with them uh, right now. So first off, land titles, because lots of people think blockchain and land titles is kind of a, a popular thing. So a land registry system, like we have in Ontario, we have something called TerraView. It can be so easily transferred over to a blockchain, and uh, this would allow you to transfer land titles via smart contract. It would it it it's it's a it's a it's a it's something that would be probably the most beneficial in a 
in places where there's a lot of corruption or where people don't trust the government. But it's important to remember that in order for a land title system or land registry system to be legally valid, it must be recognized in law by that particular jurisdiction. So you can't just build a technological solution and hope that it will somehow sort of like re completely change the land title system and redistribute wealth, you know. So something to keep in mind. Um, Crypto kitties. Uh, I think Edwin mentioned it already. Um, it's a smart contract uh, that creates a, a virtual collectible cat that you can sell and trade. And uh, in the British Columbia uh, securities regulator sort of ruled that crypto kitties are not a security. They are a new asset class called crypto collectibles. And that's because there's no expectation that they will increase in value. So in that, obviously some do. Um, which is a little nuts, but in, in, in that sense, they're very, more similar to Beanie Babies than they are to um, stocks. Um, okay, um, uh, wills and employment contracts. So, like I said, smart contracts can transfer assets upon a specific event, such as death or performance of work. And, but these types of contracts are outside the traditional legal framework. Um, however, there's some interesting projects happening, like open law by consensus is creating a legal markup language so that when you draft or when a lawyer drafts a legal contract, those inputs will be put into a smart contract and uh, it can be deployed on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, to me, why this is kind of interesting is because um, it can sort of change the nature of the employment relationship. So for example, instead of being paid every two weeks, you could be paid by the minute as you're working. So, and that money could be sent to your bank account. So that's something that's kind of interesting to me. Um, and then lastly, corporations. So um, smart contracts can create corporate governance structures. Um, in the law world, it would be akin to something like Articles of Incorporation or something like that. Um, so these are sometimes called DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. I don't know if you've heard that term. And they be can behave in ways similar to regular corporations. Um, namely, they can raise money. They raise capital um, like a regular corporation would. Um, and they do that through ICOs, Initial Coin Offerings. So that's what we were talking about with the token, issuing tokens and all of that sort of stuff. So ICOs are um, a blockchain version of crowdfunding where anyone in the world can participate. And it's its its, its own topic. We could spend a lecture on it, but I'm not going to go into it too much. But I'm, I'm going to use um, like a, a legal case study to sort of take apart what can happen when things go wrong. Um, so, in 2016, a decentralized autonomous organization called the DAO, which is confusing because it's a DAO called the DAO, uh, <laughs> uh, wanted, they wanted, what they're trying to do is they wanted to be the first uh, digital decentralized investment fund. Um, and it was one of the very first ICOs. Um, at the time, it raised 11.5 million Ether, which was $90 million. And today, today it would be $1 billion. Um, so, um, a couple of things went wrong. Uh, first, um, the contract, the smart contract, was not properly audited um, by Socket, who are the developers. Um, there was a money draining bug that was able that that was exploited by a hacker, and then 31 million dollars was under the control of that hacker. So, um, and now I just want to flesh out some legal issues that this brings up. Um, so, in that smart contract, it the they wrote uh, code is law, but code is not law. Law is law. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and but what law applies in this situation? So the DAO sort of demonstrates how our notions of jurisdiction are being challenged, especially when there are uh, potential plaintiffs all over the world. So um, if you've ever been involved in any sort of legal proceeding, you have to file in a specific jurisdiction. So 
Um, here you have the danger of jurisdiction shopping. So a plaintiff could just file in a jurisdiction that has favorable regulations for whatever reason, even though they don't live there. So that's one da danger. And um, there's some interesting technical solutions to this. So many people are incorporating arbitration clauses into their smart contracts um, to sort of prevent, uh, to, to to sort of uh, limit this this potential. Um, so um, another thing that the DAO touches on is our issues of negligence and liability. Okay, obviously the hacker was um, uh, a nefarious actor, but like what was Slocket's responsibility and were they negligent in not having the contract properly audited? And, and that being said, they had no way of knowing that it would raise that much money and then also, what's the responsibility of the investors? This is an extremely speculative thing. Um, there's a legal principle called caveat emptor, which is buyer beware. So um, do they really expect to, to get their money back if something went wrong? Um, and then that leads into the notion of damages. So in order to file a claim, um, you must have suffered a loss. But what loss did they suffer? Um, so cryptocurrency is, uh, in law, is not uh, regarded as money currently. And it's a complicated, that issue has not been settled. It's a complicated legal uh, question, but it, it, is not, it is not money right now. So um, with respect to the victims of the DAO hack, like how could they have to demonstrate that they've suffered a harm? That would be very difficult to do because it would be like saying, oh, I, I lost all my fairy dust. Like, please, you know, that sort of, that sort of thing. So, um, but, you know, maybe that will change. And I think it will uh, within the next year or so. I think the, the, the CRA will come up with something or the, or the Bank of Canada will, will, will uh, make a statement regarding cryptocurrencies. And then uh, lastly, there's... Um, brings up this legal issue of appropriate remedies. So in law, you would have like con contractual remedies um, or tort, rem like if you had an issue with your employer or contractual remedies if, or tort remedies if you were uh, hit by a car or something like that. Um, but you also have something called equitable remedies. And, um, and that's what happened in the DAO. So it was resolved using a technical solution called a fork which basically all the nodes on the network got together and decided to bifurcate the chain. So on one chain, it was um, the DAO happened, the hacker kept some of the money, um, and on the other chain, the DAO never happened. History was erased, and uh, those that were victims of the DAO hack were able to get some of the money back. So that now we have two chains, Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. So. Um, and um, at the time, it was a little controversial because it goes against this principle of immutability, but it was equitable. It was an equitable remedy at the time. So um, next slide. Sure, sure, thank you. So I just, I just wanted to, talk, to use this as an example of how um, uh, the blockchain is sort of really pushing uh, our notions of jurisdiction and liability and and control and uh, and ownership and and they're sort of being disrupted by the technology um, and regulators around the world don't really know what to make of it. They're having a really hard time. So you have some countries that are outright banning the tech technology. You have other countries taking more of a wait and see approach, like like Canada. Um, you have the UK is creating. Um, regulatory sandboxes to encourage innovation. Um, but um, I, I just, uh, it's sort of the wild west of law. Um, and it's, I think it's, to me, it's important to be mindful of how the role, obviously the role that lawyers play in creating policy, but also in helping to um, draft, or to design technology that is equitable and just, and to build that into the technology. So um, that's all. If you had any answers to this question or any thoughts. Well, I think, that, I think you said something that's, that's very important here, which 
God, these mics. I got it on. I got it on. It's okay. The crisis has passed for the moment. Um, what you said about code is not the law. The law is the law is so important, which is that if this is going to work, it's it's great to see lawyers and designers and other people, you know, in the room involved with this technology because if this is going to work. It's not going to be because a bunch of programmers think that they can reinvent the economic system because they know a lot more about it than everybody else, which is the the classic piece of programmer hubris. Um, there's that XKCD cartoon that's like, um, you know, wow, this is a really hard problem, and someone's like, well, I'll solve it with algorithms, and then one year later, it's like, wow, this is a really hard problem. Yeah, we told you. You know, there's there's whole fields of study of international law and economics, and otherwise, those spent a lot of time thinking about these issues in specialized language, and I, I'm I, I'm glad to see as I think sort of the the space matures that people get involved who don't have programming backgrounds necessarily, because that's the only way that these are going to get addressed. Because in my experience, the programmers aren't going to do it on their own. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very interesting. Like me and uh, sorry, Nelly and I were at uh, at Austin presenting the, 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 the first uh, presentation to, uh, to a, a room full of lawyers. It's interesting that their questions were are oh sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so at York University, it was very interesting that the questions that they asked were pretty like very very uh, interesting. They're very technical based. Uh, like basically, who's in charge if if this happens, or who what happened? Um, like a lot, lot of like legal technical questions were asked there, and and uh, they brought up some problems that like we didn't think even existed. Um, and you mentioned how you can make sure CryptoKitties is only one, there's only one. Um, the act of making the, the network say something else is called forking it. So if the network forked, then you can have multiple CryptoKitties. Uh, the thing is, back in the day, that was 2015 when the fork happened, I think it was much easier to do that. The network, network was much smaller. You didn't need to convince millions of people. Vitalik, Vitalik, the, the architect of uh, Ethereum, he had a lot of sway with uh, the network uh, back then. It, to do the same thing now would be much more different. And in, in some ways, I'm kind of glad it happened in the past and that we went through this. Yeah. Just sir, to, that, to that end, you were talking at the beginning about switching from uh, proof of work to proof of stake. Wouldn't that require a fork of some sort? Uh, yeah, so like, like all other software, like it, it can be updated. And yes, it does require a fork into the new kind of system. What Ethereum is proposing to do to kind of lessen the, the gravitas of, of this is to switch to a hybrid system first and slowly kind of um, ease out the miners and switch to the validator system. Um, so at first, um, and I don't know when they're going to roll this out, but what they're going to do is they're going to have the miners still be there, but then for X amount of blocks, um, those are going to be determined by the validators. Um, they call them epics, I think. So for like a hundred, after every hundred blocks, um, the those the determinants of like one epic are the proof of stake validators, but the miners will still be there. But yes, that will require um, working. Yeah. Yeah. The, the intention is not to like have so many miners drop off. If you just yeah immediately. I have a a a, a thought and a and a question. And a sort of an interpretation of, or, or some th th thoughts around the idea of, of code and law and them being the same or different. Um, and I say this as somebody who knows very little about law, so I would be interested in sort of getting your, your thoughts on this. And that is one of, the, one of the differences that it seems to me as somebody, I'm a software developer, um, so I, I'm sort of familiar with that space. but. But as I said, not not with law. One of the important differences, it seems to me, uh, between those two worlds is that in in computing, um, 
encoding something, information or, or, or instructions in the form of algorithms is, is, is very brittle and hard to modify in the sense that to encode something on a computer, we have to encode it as a number ultimately, and we have to decide when we're going to encode something as a number, we have to decide what those numbers are going to mean. And so, so the, 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 amount, the number of things that, the vocabulary of things that we can, that we can express has to be decided upon whenever you write the, the encoding that you want to capture that information in. Um, and then if you want to then come back to that in the future, it, it can be a difficult problem to sort of expand or make something more flexible or change the sizes of the vocabulary. So we have a system that can be very brittle and hard to change. It seems to me to have a working legal system, there has to be people involved. So, so we, have, we have laws that we've written, um, but, but to, to have those laws function, we have, we have judges and we have courts and we have people that are, that are looking at the, the, the laws and, and the cases that have come sort of that are related to, to the laws. And we're, we're applying, we're applying these things that we've agreed upon in new situations, but we're able to evolve our thinking and we're able to add to the laws and we're, and we're, 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 we're having human, human determination and thinking and arguing um, I, 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 as we're using these things. There, there, there are people involved, whereas something that, that's encoded so a computer can understand it, there aren't people involved. Um, I mean, there are people that write the software, but there are people that build the computers. But once, once the machinery is running, and the people are out of the system. So there isn't this, there isn't this mechanism by which there, there are people that are doing the interpreting of what we meant. Um, does that make sense? And I'm wondering, uh, like, how does that? How does I, how does that? Well, I, I, I think um, maybe not so much for blockchain, but I think those, those questions are being raised um, by people that work in, um, in AI and, and that its application to uh, the law. I read a paper called the future or the, the legal singularity and about how, how that, um, that would all play out and having um, sort of dueling AI, um, AI uh, lawyers of, um, uh, I think there's, I, like the truth is, I don't know. There, there's there's a um, there's a, a a tremendous need for um, access to justice for uh, to for affordable legal services for people to access the court. And if technology can help in some way by uh, freeing up some of those resources for 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 other things, then I think that would be great. I think there are certain situations where. Um, like a, a criminal proceeding where maybe we don't want to have uh, technology, uh, like uh, we don't want to replace that human element and also the fact that um, that the courts, uh, like over time they evolve, they look at past precedents, but they, they, they obviously, they, they look at the sentiment of, of society and what's happening in, in the world and they make and human judges make decisions based on that, and so that's how the law moves over time. And I, I don't know how, exactly how we can build that into, um, like a an AI judge who is just looking at the facts and the facts and what was decided here and what was decided there, and sort of coming to a conclusion based based on on past past cases. So, um, I want to say that like when you mentioned oracles earlier. Um, I, well, first of all, I think that there's kind of a ut utopic kind of um, 
view of, you know, like in the old Star Trek trope where they kind of uh, land on this planet and there's this gigantic god that the natives are worshipping. It turns out to be a huge computer that, like, determines what is law and what isn't. And I, I think that there will always be a human aspect, like, um, in terms of this. And you mentioned oracles in terms of providing uh, input from from uh, the real world into these uh, systems, well, that could be a thermostat that essentially, um, when a temperature drops off to a certain point, does something. It could also be a person. It could also be a judge that officiates that contract or a third party um, that um, kind of signs the smart contract with the private key to prove that something happened in the outside world. Um, and as of right now, smart contracts can't actually self-act. They always have to be um, activated by a person. So, a person, so. For something for me, though, I, I was sort of thinking about um, we have biases in the real world, in the legal system, and how do we not replicate those biases in the in in the technology? So, um, you know, you mentioned earlier about how we're just the same. Uh, Worst elements of of uh, capitalism are sort of being re, re, um, replicated in the blockchain space, and um, I I don't know it would be much worse for the legal system if the the, the, the yeah, biases were. Replicated. I I'm tremendously interested in this topic, which is.